Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, both people here in the Leeds Library, and it's nice to see so many people have come to an in-person meeting, which I think is more sociable than Zoom, although I know Zoom is convenient for lots of people, and we do have far more people listening to this talk on Zoom this evening than are here in the room. As you know, we were unable to hold our meeting in September, so this is the first meeting of our 2022 23 program and I welcome you both members of the Thorsby Society and any visitors. It's my great pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker Danny Fryer who is a researcher and historian who specializes in local back history and the Leeds West Indian Carnival. He's contributed items and information to numerous exhibitions in Leeds and contributed to a lot of research. He's written for Down Your Way magazine Community Highlights magazine and various newspapers, including the Yorkshire Evening Post. He's curated two of his own exhibitions at the Leeds Central Library and gives guided black history walks and talks on various black history subjects at the Central Library, Chapel Town Library, the Abbey House Museum, and here this evening. He's also a contributor to the upcoming book, Popular Music in Leeds, Histories, Heritage, People and Places. So welcome, Danny, and we're looking forward with great interest to your talk. So we've only got about an hour together, so I'm just going to get straight into the talk, um, which the topic of before Windrush Black people living in Leeds and Bradford between the years 1708 and 1948. Now, the first Britons were Black. Britain's earliest known inhabitant was Cheddar Man, and he lived in Britain about 10,000 years ago. And science has shown us that he had dark skin and black curly hair, and this is an image of what he may have looked like. We also know of the White Hawk Woman, who lived in Britain around 5,600 years ago, and she too had dark skin and black curly hair. Science has also shown us that the earliest known Irish population had dark skin and black curly hair. With that in mind, we can say with confidence that the first Yorkshire folk were black. The question then is not when did people of color first arrive here, but when did white people first arrive? We know that white skin is fairly recent in modern humans. It developed around 22,000 years ago and first appeared in Europe around 5,000 years ago. So we know that the first Europeans were black and there were no white Europeans until around 5,000 years ago. And the first people who settled in Yorkshire would have looked similar to Cheddar Man and the White Hawk Woman. And this is what the White Hawk Woman would have looked like. We know that people settled at the site of Star Car in North Yorkshire around 11,000 years ago. So what about African migrants? We know that there was a small number of Africans who lived in Kent during the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, but the first Africans to arrive in Yorkshire did so around 2000 years ago during the Roman era. In York, the remains of two cemeteries show that 11% of those buried in the cemetery for the poorer people were of African heritage, and 12% of those buried in the cemetery for the wealthy were of African heritage. What, it, what we also find is that up to 38% of those buried in the cemetery for the poorer people were of mixed race, and up to 51%, that's over half, of those buried in the cemetery for the wealthy people were of mixed race. So we find that there was Africans in all levels of society in Roman York, and other Africans were buried elsewhere in York, including the ivory bangle lady. And this is an image of what she may have looked like. The ivory bangle lady was of North African heritage and she was a wealthy woman and of a high uh, status. She was buried with a number of um, grave goods, including two bangles, one made of jet, which probably came from Whitby and another made from ivory, which came from Africa. But there was no Af Africans of a higher status than the African-born Emperor Septimus Servius, who lived in York 
making it the center of the Roman Empire. York was also a center for African religion during the Roman period. There's evidence of the worship of Egyptian deities found across Yorkshire and the goddess Isis was popular. We also find evidence that people in Yorkshire were mummifying their dead according to Egyptian customs in East, South, North and West Yorkshire. So we're getting closer to home. Over 60 mummies have been found in York alone. And some of those mummies who were mummified in Yorkshire were of African heritage. Now in York, the Egyptian uh, legate of the Sixth Legion, Victorious, built a temple to the Egyptian god uh, Serpius. So in York, 2000 years ago, we find Africans building temples to African gods so that other Africans can worship. Now we know that the Sixth Legion had at least one African member and they were based in York, but they also had links to Leeds. A Roman villa built near Boston Spa has connections to the Sixth Legion. But there was other Africans in the Roman army. We know that uh, five, uh, 500 Afro-Romans in the army were stationed up north at Hadrian's Wall, which must have been an absolute uh, shock for them because they were used to warmer climates and Hadrian's Wall is right at the north of England and it must have been absolutely freezing. But we can take comfort in the knowledge that they kept their feet warm with woolen socks. And uh, these socks may have been made from wool that came from Yorkshire. We know that there were Roman era sheep farms existed in um, Yorkshire. So some of these wool that made these socks may have come from Yorkshire. Now the Roman roads connected Leeds and other parts of Yorkshire to the world, including North Africa. And Roman worldwide trade was so important to Yorkshire folk that some of them made counterfeit coins. Trade along the Roman roads brought objects from Africa to Yorkshire and objects from Yorkshire to Africa. Roman trade brought gold, copper, wood, papyrus and ivory from Africa to Yorkshire. And we found a number of ivory objects in York, including bangles and ivory fan handles. Now we know that there was a small African population in post-Roman uh, England between the 5th and the 10th centuries. But what about the Vikings? Surely there were no black Vikings. Well, we know that the Vikings traveled across the world, including to North Africa. We know that a small number of Africans were brought to Ireland by the Vikings in the ninth century. We know that African women were living in uh, Norwich and in Fairford in the 10th century. And in York, we know that at least one African man was living in York during the 10th century when York was occupied by the Vikings. Now, one of the things that we come across in this day of, um, of the internet is uh, pseudo history, fake history. And um, I've seen an increase in this um, in, in black history. And one of the rumors that I've heard is that the, the Moors, the African Moors um, came to England and settled in Moortown. Now there's absolutely no evidence of that whatsoever. But what we do know is that Africans did come and were brought to England during the Middle Ages and especially during the period of the Crusades. We know that African Muslims and Middle Eastern Muslims lived across Britain during this period. We know of a man, for example, a man named uh, Mohammed who lived near York in 1327. Now he was definitely a Muslim and he may have been an African. We know that other Africans lived in Britain following the period after the Crusades and many of those were Muslims. We know that um, around 60 African Muslims converted to Christianity during the Tudor period. So there was at least 60 African Muslims in Tudor Britain 
So what about diversity in early modern leads? So there's no evidence yet of Africans living in medieval Leeds, but we do know that there were French, Irish, Scottish, and Icelandic people living in Leeds. And in June 1572, the baptism of Elizabeth, child of Anthony Smalley, the Egyptian, took place in Leeds. Now, Anthony Smalley was not an Egyptian. He was um, a Romani gypsy, and the word gypsy is short for Egyptian because the gypsies, the Romani gypsies had um, dark complexions and many people believed them to have been Egyptians. But even though he wasn't Egyptian, we do know that the Smalley family were most likely the first people of color to live in Leeds. Now the Smalley family lived in Leeds during a period when Leeds was unwelcoming to people of different races, nationalities and religion. To give an example, in 1584, the parish church refused to bury Richard Lumby, a Catholic man from Chapeltown, although he was most likely from Chapel Allenton, which was known as Chapeltown at that time. They eventually agreed to bury him, but only at night. And what this shows us is how the people of Leeds treat people who were different from the norm. We find a number of strangers recorded in Tudor church records in Leeds. And these were people who were from outside of Leeds. And they came from other parts of England, including Manchester, but others were Irish, Scottish, and Dutch. Now the black population of England increased from the 16th century onwards. Black people lived across the north of England notably in Manchester, but also in Liverpool. Many of them were servants, either enslaved or free. But we must remember that not all of England's black population were servants. For example, in 1687, we have a record of John Moore, a black man who was granted the freedom of York, and this was a privilege that he would have had to pay for. But black servants did work and live across Yorkshire as early as the 16th century. We have a record of a woman named Anne who was a servant in Hull in 1598. But there were many, many others. In Pontefract, Thomas uh, Walton worked as a servant. Richard Brown was a servant in Wakefield. And in Doncaster, we find Caesar Watson who was a servant. And these are just three of the black servants who lived and worked in 18th century Yorkshire. Now the first person in Leeds, the first, sorry, the first black person in Leeds was recorded in February 1708 when he attended the Leeds Parish Church. He was recorded only as Kershaw's black and he was a servant employed by the Reverend Richard Kershaw, the rector of Ripley. Richard Kershaw was the cousin of Ralph, uh, Ralph Fonsby and he was the brother of Samuel Kershaw, a merchant from Leeds who had links to Jamaica. Samuel Kershaw had donated items from Jamaica to Ralph Farnsby's collection in Leeds. And it was likely through his brother's connection to Jamaica that Richard Kershaw acquired a black servant. But we don't know at this time how uh, much the Kershaws were directly involved in slavery in the Caribbean. Now, Kershaw's black, as he was recorded in Leeds in 1708, was baptized at the All Saints Church at Ripley on the 8th of June, 1707, and his given name was John Lewis. Ralph Fonsbury wrote in his diary that he was the first black person baptized in these parts. And until about two weeks ago, I thought that meant Leeds, but it turns out it meant Yorkshire. Um, his baptism may have been symbolic of his freedom. We know that servants were often baptized um, to show that they had gained their freedom. It was believed that um, once a person had been baptized, they couldn't be enslaved because a Christian couldn't enslave a fellow Christian. But there was absolutely no law at this time to support that. 
So baptisms were often symbolic. We know that other enslaved people in Yorkshire were emancipated either at the hands of their enslavers or by escaping. Thomas Anson was one of over 800 Africans who escaped slavery in England. And he ran away from Dent in West Yorkshire in 1758. I'm going to talk a bit now about the Black Georgians of Yorkshire. We know um, Thomas Anson, who escaped slavery in Yorkshire, later joined Sir Robert Rich's regiment of dragoons as a trumpeter in 1760. And he was with the regiment as a trumpeter for many years until he lost a tooth and could no longer play the trumpet. After that, he retired. This regiment um, had many black musicians during the 18th century, including black drummers. And they came to Leeds in 1749. And when they did, it was noted that all the drummers in the regiment were black and rode white horses. One of those drummers was a man named Thomas Mawson, and he was arrested, but later acquitted for the murder of a Leeds man named John Johnson. We also know of Thomas Granada, who was baptized in Bristol in 1769, and of Sophia Pierce, who was a black girl from London who worked in a cotton mill in Berlin, Wharfdale in 1797 and 1798. It was also Thomas Smith, who was um, a black nut seller in Bradford in 1820. And Betsy Sawyer, who was a servant in Eden from 1823 until 1839. Now these black Georgians in Yorkshire were loved and respected. Thomas Mawson was quitted, uh, quitted at a time when black men were more, more likely to be found guilty, less likely to have their charge reduced and less likely to be acquitted. Baptisms of black servants like Thomas Granada often symbolized their freedom, but also symbolized their acceptance into society. If you were baptized, you were accepted into the church. And if you were accepted into the church, you were accepted into society. So Sophia Pierce's wish to return to London was not only granted, but her travel expenses were paid for. And although Thomas Smith was attacked in Bradford in 1820, the press expressed disgust at his attacker. Betsy Sawyer was a member of a local Methodist society and was said to be loved and respected. When she died in 1839, her friends in the Methodist Society erected a memorial stone in her honor, which can still be seen in Eden today. What about diversity in Georgian Yorkshire? So the world has always been diverse in, pattern, in terms of religion, race, and sexuality. Yorkshire is no exception. People of color, and LGBTQIA plus people have always been here. This is truly a shared history. For example, in 1825, Cook's Circus came to Leeds and among the performers was Pablo Pab Pab uh, Paddington, a black woman who performed and lived as a man. And she had a relationship with Miss King who was of the same circus. There was also in that circus at the same time, John Clifford, or to give her a birth name, Ellen Lofer, who was a woman of South Asian heritage who lived and performed as a man. Now she had a relationship with a man and at some point he must have become aware that she was a woman because she became pregnant. And their true um, genders were discovered. They were discovered to be born female while in York in 1827, and they were exposed in the local press. But despite being exposed, they continued to work for Cook Circus and made appearances in Leeds in the 1830s and 1840s. Now, this is the part of the talk where we're going to talk about slavery. <clears throat> 
And this is a subject that many people can find uncomfortable and they should because it was absolutely disgusting. And I'm not going to go into too many details of the horrors of slavery and what happened, but I will say that every act of violence and brutality that can be carried out upon a person or a group of people took place within the context of slavery in the British Caribbean. Now we mustn't feel ashamed or embarrassed by the actions of those that came before us. As um, Dr. Arthur France MBE says, nobody can be responsible for the past, but we must all take responsibility for the future. Uh, like many towns in Britain, Leeds and Bradford had links to the transatlantic slave trade. Both towns grew wealthy from the cloth trade. Yorkshire woolen firms made goods to be traded for enslaved Africans and to be sold to plantations in the Americas. Goods from Africa, such as palm oil, were used in factories and mills in Yorkshire. The Leeds and Liverpool Canal allowed large quantities of goods to be transported across the country. Slave produced goods from America and the Caribbean arrived in Leeds and Bradford to be sold on or to be used in factories and mills. For example, Benjamin Gott used slave produced dyes in his mills. Slave produced cotton played a key role in the textile industries of Leeds and Bradford. During the 18th century, Leeds had a small number of cotton mills, but cotton also played a key role in the woolen industry as well. Profits could also be made from slave produced goods such as coffee, sugar, rum, and tobacco. Those selling and buying these goods uh, contributed to the trade. Otley born Thomas Chippendale used slave produced wood to build his famous furniture, which was bought by Charles Ingram of Temple Newsom House and Edwin Lascelles of Airwood House, and that furniture is still present in those houses today. The Lascelles were just one of the families making a profit from the forced labour of people in the Caribbean. The Oates family had various connections too. Hibber Oates, born in Leeds in 1797, had plantations in Jamaica. His brother, Robert Oates, born in Leeds in 1798, was a captain with the West India Company, a slave trading company. And a third brother, George Hibber Oates, born in Leeds in 1791, owned a plantation in Jamaica and fathered a number of children with enslaved women. George Hibbert Oates wasn't the only man from Leeds to father children with enslaved women. We know of Andrew Judge, who was an indentured servant contracted to the future president of the United States, George Washington, in Virginia in the 1770s. And he fathered a daughter with one of George Washington's slaves named Betty. Other enslavers had links to Leeds. Henry Ibbotson and William Walker co-owned a plantation in Jamaica in 1784. James Wells uh, moved to Leeds as a young man in 1782 and then became an enslaver in Jamaica. Others settled in Leeds after becoming rich from slavery in the Caribbean. A Scottish woman named Eleanor Douglas co-owned a plantation in Jamaica and later lived in Park Square. Bertina Bird was an enslaver in Jamaica who later lived in Pudsey. And Francis W. H. Martin was another enslaver in the Caribbean and he lived in Eden where he worked as a chemist. Luke Thomas Crossley lived in Leeds in the 1830s at a time when he owned three plantations in Jamaica. And these are just some of the over 30 people linked to Leeds and Bradford who enslaved people in the Caribbean. Some enslaved hundreds, others enslaved less than 10. But the Lascelles of Harewood House enslaved almost 3,000 people, more than all the other local enslavers combined. Now we talk a lot 
about the transatlantic slave trade, but something that we don't talk about often is the East India Company. The East India Company relied on the forced labor of enslaved Africans from the West and East Africa, especially from Mozambique and Madagascar. These Africans were enslaved by the company in India, Indonesia, and the island of St. Helena in the uh, Antarctic Ocean. Now the Lascelles family also were also involved in the East India Company. Between 1742 and 1746, Henry Lascelles was a director of the East India Company, and his son, also named Henry, was a captain with the company in the same period. The East India Company imported goods from China that included the very fashionable and very expensive Chinese wallpaper. And examples of these can be seen at Harewood House and Temple Newsom. Now enslaved people were brought to Yorkshire by their enslavers. Some were kept as enslaved servants and some escaped like Thomas Anson. Some were freed. We know of John York, who was freed in Yorkshire in 1776, and his family later lived in Bradford. Betsy Sawyer was freed in Eden in 1823, and in later years, fugitive slaves from America came to Leeds. The now famous William and Ellen Craft stayed in Leeds in 1851, and we know of John William, who lived in Leeds in 1858, he was a former slave from America, and so was Mr. J. Hughes, who lived in Leeds in 1859. Now this research has compiled a list of over 125, uh, 120 identified uh, black people living in Leeds and Bradford between 1708 and 1948 but there are a number of unidentified black people in the records. Many are mentioned in newspapers, but their names are not given. And a few like this gentleman here appear in photographs. As research continues, more names will be added to the list and some unidentified black residents will be identified. For example, last year when this research began, Thomas Smith, the black nut seller from Bradford was previously unidentified, but we've now found a name for him. Now, there wasn't just one black population in Leeds, there was diversity within the black uh, population of Leeds. Black people arrived from Leeds and Bradford from across the world during the Victorian era and beyond. They came from different cultural and religious backgrounds and they spoke different languages. British born black people came from other parts of England, Scotland and Wales. And black people also came from Canada and North America and others came from South America and the Caribbean. And of course, black people arrived in Leeds and Bradford from various parts of Africa. Now, many of the black people living in Leeds and Bradford were men and many of them married white women. Among them, were John Williams, who lived in Leeds in the 1840s, Alfred Harris, who was living in Queensbury in the 1870s, William King, who was living in Bradford in the 1870s, William Dixon, who was living in Bradford in the 1880s, and Joseph Downey, who was living in Leeds in the 1890s. And this is a photograph of Joseph Downey. Some white women who lived in Leeds and Bradford um, left their husbands to marry black men. We've got more than one newspaper account of a white woman leaving her husband to marry a black man. And some black women also married white men. We know of Elizabeth Magnus, who lived in Leeds in the 1830s and was married to a white man. And of course, these um, relationships naturally resulted in the birth of children. We know that mixed race children were born in Leeds as early as the 1830s. But we also know that some black children arrived in Leeds at a young age. For example, we know that Edwin and Emma Smith of Roundhay adopted an Ethiopian, Ethiopian boy named Saeed Enboy in the 1830s. But there's evidence of other um, 
black and mixed race children living in Leeds and Bradford, such as this photograph of this young uh, boy here, whose identity is unknown. And these were the beginnings of family legacies in West Yorkshire. The descendants of George Orr, Albert May, Joseph Downey, and Thomas Milgram still live in Yorkshire today. There is evidence of wealthy, black middle-class people living in Leeds and Bradford during the Victorian era. Some dressed well and had their photographs taken in a studio, which was a luxury at the time. This was true for the unidentified black boy photographed by Charles Hall in Leeds in the 1870s, and that was the boy from the previous slide. And this was also true for the unidentified black man photographed by Joshua Lister in Bradford in the 1890s. And that was the uh, man on the unidentified um, slide. Now this gentleman on this slide is George York of Bradford. And he could also afford to dress well and have his photograph taken in the studio. And the photograph shows us that he could also afford to eat well. <laughs> we also know of um, William Stewart who lived in Leeds and in 1901, the Yorkshire Evening Post described him as a smart looking and well dressed man. However, the majority of Black Victorians were working class people employed in a variety of jobs. For example, Charles H.W. Francis was an ostler employed at the Burnswick Hotel. Abraham Johnson worked at the uh, Marshall Temple's work. And this is Abraham Johnson here. Joseph Downey worked at the Leeds Steelworks. John McWilliams was a gas house laborer. John Dowles and William Dixon were both laborers in Bradford. Eliza Gray and George Bertie Robinson were both servants in Victorian Leeds. Some black people in Leeds and Bradford during the Victorian period were self employed. Thomas Smith was a nut seller in Bradford and both uh, William Johnson and Edward Walton were flower hawkers. And this is an image of Edward Walton. And Abraham Johnson, after he'd worked in Leeds, later became a street vendor in Bradford. Some black Victorians living, uh, lived in poverty and struggled to survive. We know that a black homeless man was begging on the streets of Leeds in 1839. And in Bradford in that same year, we find two black men, William Walker and Thomas Johnson, who were arrested for begging. We know that William James died in a Bradford poorhouse in 1843. And Clarissa Clara Brown, who was the daughter of the African-American author, William Wells Brown, died at the workhouse in Leeds in 1874. And this gentleman here is Thomas Jackson, who was known as Old Tom. And he was a known beggar in Bradford, and he died at the infirmary, uh, Union Infirmary in Keithley in 1897. Now, most black people who appeared in the local newspapers were linked to crime in some way. But the same can be said for most um, working class white people because that's the nature of newspapers. They like to report on crimes. Black people were often the victims of violent crimes. We know that a black man named John Williams and his wife Mary were attacked twice while traveling from Leeds to Bradford and back. Others like Eliza Gray and John Lawrence were robbed on the streets of Leeds and both those robberies were violent robberies. Other black people were sentenced for being drunk and disorderly or for fighting, so it was mainly petty crimes. And to give an example, in 1849, a black man in Bradford was fined for pouring his chamber pot into a grate in the street. Now, some black people like Eliza Gray received justice in court. The man who robbed her was sentenced to imprisonment. And when William Brown was accused of theft in Bradford in 1885, witnesses were called to the court to prove his innocence. Some black Victorians, however, turned to crime as a way to survive. 
William and James Lang were well-known thieves in the Leeds Bridge area, and they were arrested numerous times during the 1850s and 1860s. We also know of Louisa Wilde, who escaped arrest in 1837 by simply running away and jumping over a hedge. But she was later arrested in Bradford for uh, being drunk and disorderly in 1838. And the man shown here in this image was Charles Alexander Edwards, and he was a West Indian con man, and he traveled the country for decades committing various crimes. He was in Leeds in 1888 and 1889 and possibly 1890, but it's unclear. And when he appeared in a car in Leeds for assaulting his landlady, he claimed to be an East African prince from Ethiopia to get off lightly. And this was something that he did across the country. He would commit crimes, appear in court, claim to be a prince of some sort or another and get off lightly. But then when he appeared in court more than once, he fled the um, town or city and would later appear somewhere else. Um, at other times, he had claimed to be a wealthy gentleman, a West African prince from um, around the Nigeria area and even an Indian prince. And what would happen with um, Charles Alexander Edwards was eventually when he um, would appear in newspapers in one town or another, people from the other town that he'd just been at would write to the newspapers and say, oh, this man has been to our town just a few months back and you should be uh, wary of him. He's not actually a prince. Now, of course there were um, real African royalty in the Victorian era. And um, a number of real African princes came to live in Leeds and Bradford and other parts of Yorkshire. We know of uh, Saeed Engoy, who was an Ethiopian prince adopted by a Leeds couple, and he grew up in York during the 1840s and 1850s. We know of Richard Umhala, Halala, who was a South African prince brought to Bradford by the 90th Regiment of Foot in 1848. And he died um, in Bradford as a young boy and is uh, buried there. And we know of Prince Alamayu, who was an Ethiopian prince who lived and studied in Leeds in 1879. And this is a photograph of him. Now he um, came ill while he was in Leeds and he later uh, died in, in 1879. Now, Queen Victoria had taken a great interest in the young prince, and she'd taken a keen interest in his education and his life, and she noted his death in her diary, and she arranged for him to be buried at St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle. Other African royalty visited Leeds and Bradford during the Victorian era, and when they did, they attracted large crowds. People came out to see them. Now we're going to talk a little bit about um, the social lives of these black residents. We know that James and William Lang had white friends and James Lang was reported to have drunk in a pub with one of his white friends. We know that Charles Alexander Edwards had drank champagne at the Queen's Hotel with one of his friends who we assume was white and had drank at the Victoria Hotel and had even been um, kicked out of the Victoria Hotel by a policeman. Charles Alexander Edwards also enjoyed gambling and horse racing, and by all accounts, he was a bit of a ladies' man. We know that people, that black people visited Leeds during the Victorian period. John Lawrence and uh, John Edwards Froster were two black visitors to Leeds, and they uh, too drank in Leeds pubs. And both John Edwards Froster and Joseph Downey had sang in pubs in Leeds. Now the two gentlemen pictured here, are, um, Billy Benker Johnson and his son, Glenn Johnson, who went on to be a famous boxer. And they lived in Leeds in the Edwardian period. And Billy Benker Johnson worked for a time in a pub in Hunslet. So he would have been a familiar face to the community. Other black people traveled outside of Leeds, perhaps to visit friends or family. We know that John Williams and his wife had traveled to Bradford from Leeds 
and that Joseph Simonetti had travelled um, to Leeds from Liverpool. Now, black Victorians were very much a part of their local communities. For example, in 1884, Alexander Harris was the leader of the Salvation Mission Army uh, in Bramley, and he played the kettle drum in their band. Joseph Downey was remembered fondly in Hunslet decades after his death. Edward Walton was so well known that his death was reported in the Leeds Times, not under the section for deaths, but as a news story on its own. And many black residents of Leeds and Bradford would have been Christians and they would have attended local churches. We see in later years, in the 1940s, 1950s and 1960s, a lot of black residents of Leeds and Bradford were turned away by their churches. But that doesn't seem to have been the case in earlier years when the um, black population was much smaller. And by 1913, Leeds had a black pastor, Pastor H. Smith lived in Leeds but worked across Yorkshire between 1913 and 1923. We also know that African Muslims were recorded in Leeds as early as 1901 and an African Muslim birth and an African Muslim, Muslim burial were recorded in Bradford in 1904. Many black entertainers performed in Leeds and Bradford during the Victorian era. The man pictured here is the black British circus owner Pablo Frank and he was very popular and he visited Leeds and Bradford many times over the decades and when he died in 1871 he was buried in Leeds alongside his first wife. We also know that Thomas Rutley was a member of the Fifth Jubilee Singers and they too performed in Leeds and Bradford many times during the Victorian era. And Thomas Rutlin left the Frisk Jubilee Singers and he eventually settled in Harrogate. But for a time in the 1890s, he was living in Leeds. The African-American actor Ira Aldrich performed Shakespeare in Leeds numerous times. And the African-American singer Elizabeth Greenfield came to Leeds as did the blind pianist Thomas Wiggins. Now Thomas Wiggins was known for being able to play a piece of music back after only hearing it once. And of course people thought there must have been a trick to this, that he must have been faking it. So people began to compose music especially for him and he could play it back after only hearing it once. So we've looked at um, black British performers and African-American performers, but people came also from Africa. The South African Native Choir also gave performances in Leeds during the Victorian period. Now these black men and women were celebrated and respected when they came to perform in Leeds and Bradford, but there was another side to black entertainment in Victorian and Edwardian Leeds and Bradford. Blackface minstrel shows and other forms of blackface entertainment were popular in Victorian Leeds and Bradford. And unfortunately, blackface entertainment is still continued today in some form or another. Um, black people in Leeds and Bradford were displayed at fairs and in human zoos throughout the Victorian and Edwardian period. One example is Elizabeth Magnus, who was a Leeds woman who was displayed at fairs in Leeds for a period of six years during the 1830s. And she was dis um, displayed as a hot and top Venus by her so-called husband. And in the early 20th century, a show called Savage South Africa came to Leeds and then later Bradford. And part of that show involved um, Africans being displayed alongside wild animals as savage and wild. In 1904, 100 Smiley people were displayed in a human zoo in Bradford's Lister Park for a period of months and thousands of people would come to see them in this makeshift village which had been set up in Lister Park. And there's a picture of some of them here. And as you can see, it included men, women and children. <laughs> 
And in 1905, a group of six Africans were displayed at the Grand Assembly Rooms in Leeds. And it wasn't just black people who were displayed in, in these uh, ways. We also know that Native Americans, South Asians, and the so-called Greek gypsies were displayed in similar ways in Leeds and Bradford during the Victorian and Edwardian period. Now, a number of black men became sports personalities in Leeds and Bradford. We know that Billy Benker Johnson of Hunslet was a boxer in the early 1900s, and he was the father of Len Johnson, who became a famous boxer later on. Um, William or Willie Gibb Clark played football for Bradford City between 1905 and 1909. Lucius Banks was an African-American man who played rugby for Hunslet FC in 1912. And Eddie Paris, who's pictured here, played football for Bradford Park Avenue in the 1920s and 1930s. We know of Walter uh, Meldrum and many of his brothers who were all boxers in the 1930s in the Leeds and Bradford area. And Theodore Cecil Thompson played rugby for Hunslet in the 1940s. We know of a um, West Indian man called R. H. Gordon, who was a student at Leeds University, and he played football for the Leeds University team, and he played in a match um, that was England universities versus Scotland universities. And in that same year, 1946, he also played tennis at the Davis Cup. And in 1948, the Caribbean Cricket Club was founded in Leeds by a group of West Indian migrants. And it was the first um, Caribbean Cricket Club in Britain. Now, local people also became entertainers during the 20th century. Some black people living in Leeds and Bradford were street performers or pub singers. But we also know of the Walton family who had both black, white and mixed race members in their family. And they sang, danced and played instruments on the streets of Leeds during the 1920s. Other black people became professional entertainers. For example, we know of Caroline Coffey from Bradford who toured Europe in 1913 as a member of an all black troupe. And pictured here is George Watson from Bradford who became a singer and a drummer in the 1930s. And his sister, Frances Watson was also a singer and she performed at London's Drury Lane Theatre in the 1940s. By the 20th century, Leeds and Bradford were very diverse cities. Africans, West Indians, Chinese, Japanese, and Indian people were all living in the cities. Black people were employed as entertainers, servants, builders, and laborers during the first decades of the 20th century. We know um, George Bertie Robinson, who was employed as a servant at Harewood House for almost 30 years. And this is a photograph of, um, of Bertie. But there is also evidence of a black pastor, a black bookseller, and even a black pimp living in Leeds during the first decades of the 20th century. Leeds also attracted a number of black students from the West Indies and from Africa. And while racism continued to be an issue, there were moments of acceptance and of racial harmony. For example, in 1933, some African students were reported to have attended a Hindu funeral in Leeds. And in 1938, 40 Muslims, including some from Africa, attended Eid celebrations in Leeds. And in 1936, the Battle of Holbeck Moor proved that fascists were not welcome in Leeds. Now, black men, women and children were all the victims of racism in Leeds and Bradford during the 19th and 20th centuries. And white women who were married to black men were victims of verbal and physical abuse on the streets of Leeds. First-hand accounts and newspaper paper 
articles provide insight into the racist abuse black people face. But this was not a different time. This was simply a time when black people had less of a platform to speak out again against this racism. Black people and their white allies spoke out about racism and the color bar when given the opportunity to do so. For example, in 1941, Frederick Carroll, a mixed race man living in Leeds, um, told the court after he was arrested for the assault of a white racist, I am an intelligent person, and if people <coughs> insult my color, then they insult everything I hold sacred. I am duty bound to make them apologize or do something about it. Now, some white people were disgusted at the racism that they witnessed. One white person wrote to a local newspaper in 1888 to complain over some racism that he'd witnessed on the streets of Leeds. Terms like blackie and darkie were common terms used to describe black people, but black people found these terms insulting and said so. Status had no impact on how black people were treated. The man pictured here is Lucius Banks, and despite playing rugby for the local team, he was called Hunslet's Coloured Coon by the newspapers in 1912. But we know that black people often stuck up for themselves when insulted and often fought white racists. We know that one black Victorian in Leeds took on two white laborers after they insulted his wife and called him a racist slur. This was a time when there were no laws against racism and a color bar denied black people access to the same rights, opportunities and facilities as white people. But we know that black led demonstrations against the color bar were held in Leeds and Bradford as early as the 1940s. So people were speaking out and sticking up for themselves. I'm going to talk a little bit now about the, um, the world wars. Black men and women served during both World War I and World War II. We know that Lucius Banks served in the United States Army after returning to America, and Billy Benker Johnson joined the Navy in Manchester during the First World War. But an unofficial color bar prevented other local black men from enlisting. Some black men avoided service, we have accounts of that, and others were granted exemption, and we have accounts of that as well. We know that black people served during the war in other ways. For example, we know that um, a mixed race woman was working in a munitions factory in Bradford in 1917. And we know that Thomas Morris and Ma Downey both worked at the Leeds Steel Works during the First World War. George May from uh, Bradford and Theodore Robert and Aubrey Thompson from Leeds all served during World War II. Theodore served in the Royal Navy and he was the uh, man in the last slide. Robert served in the York and Lancaster Regiment and Aubrey served in the RAF and these were three black brothers from Leeds. And again, we find black people um, serving during the war in other ways, helping the war effort. We find Francis Walton from Bradford, who was one of the women employed at the aircraft factory in Needham. And of course, black people came from across the world to help what they called the mother country. In 1942, a 15-year-old Jamaican boy named Victor uh, Garrett stalled away to England to join the Royal Navy. And he stayed in Leeds for a time where he became known as the singing sailor because he was known for his singing voice. He eventually did join the Navy and serve. Other black uh, military personnel visited Leeds during their downtime. They visited pubs, went shopping, they danced at the Mecca Ballroom, and they spent days out at Roundy Park. And many of them would settle in Leeds after the war. And in 1948, seven Jamaican men and one Trinidadian man settled in Leeds after arriving on England on board the HMT Windrush, 
they join an already growing black population. And that is where I'm going to end the story. Thank you very much indeed, Danny. That's interesting. Ten minutes for questions. People listening on Zoom, if you type your questions into chat, we will do our best to repeat them to the audience here and ask Danny to answer them. But does anybody in the room have any questions or comments they would like to pose at this point? Yes. So I'm just going to repeat the question for the benefit people. Okay. So the question was about your reference to expelling the fascists in 1936. Uh, could you perhaps enlighten us about that? Um, so, what had happened was um, a group of fascists were planning to march through Leeds. Um, there was, I think, about a thousand of them, and they were planning to um, assemble at um, Hope, okay. Hope, yeah, Hope. <laughs> And um, about 5,000 anti-fascists turned up and um, threw stones at them and got rid of them. There's um, an, an article on the, um, on the Leeds Central Library's blog, which I'll give more details. So it's a well-known incident in the history of Leeds, but perhaps with time it's been forgotten. Any other questions or comments? Do you have any questions on, on chat? So may I just say, well, I gather from what you that most of your research is based upon newspaper articles, is that right? A, a lot of it is based upon newspaper articles, yeah. Um, the, the censors don't, they record where a person was born, but they don't record their race. So um, because the British Empire was so massive, we find people born all over the world, but when we dig a little further, we find out that they, they were British. We have British born people, uh, British people born in India, in Africa, in the Caribbean, all, all over. But the newspapers tend to give a description of a person. So from the newspapers, we can, we can find out what their race was. Any questions on chat? Okay. Well, can I just thank Danny for his most informative and enlightening talk reminding us of the long history of diversity in Leeds. It's been most interesting and I'd like to, as our normal practice, express our appreciation by sending this very small book to you. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed. Thanks.